how do you convince somebody that something is beautiful? You know, how do you convince somebody that paintings are beautiful? And I think the best way to do that is to show them a few paintings, you know, which really are beautiful. I think that's the only way to do that. So, to show you that mathematics is beautiful, I've chosen this theorem of Vasik Shwatal, my teacher. And there is a story that I remember about him, you know, a conversation that I had. And it's very, very relevant to what's going on right now in Pakistan, especially in research. So once I was in a cafe and Shwatal was there and so, you know, I had a little chat with him and he said that, Sarmad, what happens in mathematics is somebody writes a paper and then it's, it starts a pile. And, you know, people start writing papers on top of it and then somebody writes a paper so that you can throw away half the pile. All right, and you know, and this keeps happening, you know, the pile gets larger and then somebody writes a paper and you can throw away most of uh, the other papers. And he said once in a while it happens that somebody writes a final nail in the coffin and then the area is sort of uh, finished, people go on to other things or you know, people lose interest in that kind of, those kind of problems. But what he told me was that Sarmat, Try not to write a paper that adds to the pile. Always try to write a paper that subtracts from it. Or, if you can, you know, write a paper that starts a pile. Okay, so, I mean, I think that's a, that's a, uh, that's, that's a tall order for me. All right, but somebody who has done that is Shwatal himself. And this is a paper that he wrote which started the pile. Okay, so this started a whole area in mathematics called the art gallery problems and um, it's a, you know, I think it's a four page paper of Shwatal, right? And after that, I think dozens of PhDs have been given on this subject. Um, hundreds of papers have been written as follow up papers, but this is the germinal. So, you know, I want to uh, just go through that. What we have here, oh, and I'm sorry, a there's a little bit of a problem matching the aspect ratio which we detected sort of right at the end. So, thoda sa upar se ye kata hua hai. But this is an art gallery and it's what mathematician call, it, call a simple polygon. So, you take a bunch of vertices and you connect them, all right, and you're not allowed to cross oneself, all right. So, you simply connect them. And then once you do that, can we go to the next, right? Then we have the inside of this polygon, all right? So we can imagine this polygon as being an art gallery. And you can think of yourself as being an architect. So you're viewing the art gallery from the top. So this is the plan of the art gallery, all right? So, you know, here you can place things, people can move around, okay? So that's an art gallery. Now, in art galleries, of course, we put precious and beautiful and, you know, amazing things. So, what we want to do is we want to guard these because these things are very precious. Okay. So, yeah. So, we uh, bring a guard and let's move her inside the art gallery. Okay. Once I've placed her in this art gallery, then uh, what she can see certain points. So, for example, this green point, okay, she'd be able to see that because it's in a line of sight, all right? Go ahead. Okay. But this red point, go ahead. That is occluded by this edge. It's not straight in her line of sight. So, she wouldn't be able to see this red point. Go ahead, please. Okay, go ahead, right? So, what we can do is, please go ahead. Okay, so this is another example. Yes, keep going ahead. All right, so that, for example, this red point will not be visible because it's occluded. So, go ahead. So, now what we can do is we can compute this region. This is called the visibility region of this point. So, if a guard is standing here, then she can only see the points in this red region. All right. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so this is called the visibility region. Go ahead, please. Okay, so if I move her somewhere else, go ahead. The visibility region changes, you know, it depends on where you're standing. 
please go ahead okay go ahead all right go ahead all right so let's place her here now what we notice in this art gallery is one guard is not enough okay somehow wherever we place her there's some part of the art gallery that she can't see right so the problem is how do you place guards so that the entire ga uh, art gallery is covered that's the schwartal's art gallery problem okay go ahead so here we've got another guard and please go ahead yeah go ahead okay so now we move the second guard and that guard can see this blue region there is some region which is visible to both of them but that's all right you know that doesn't hurt us please go ahead go ahead okay so here's a third guard we placed her there the fourth one all right go ahead and the fifth one right so now i've placed five guards and now what you notice is that the entire art gallery is covered okay so every point in the art gallery is visible to at least one guard right so schwartel's art gallery problem is i will give you an art gallery and you have to place guards so that the entire art gallery is covered now obviously if you take a lot of guards then it would be trivial right so you know if i say 1000 guards here you know you could just throw them anywhere and you'll be covered right so schwartel's problem is well what's the minimum number of guards that's needed okay oh by the way this is going to be a hybrid lecture so part of it on the um, on the uh, this thing and part of it is going to be on the board all right so this is just this animation that i had uh, uh, converted it into a movie is i've moved this guard to, to this place. Isko thoda pause kar dein, please. So now what I've done is I've placed these five guards in five different corners. And I make a very important observation that being able to see is a symmetric relation. If I am in the line of Suhail, then Suhail is in my line of sight. So in a polygon, if a point A can see point B, then B can see A right so now let's turn the table a little bit now let's say that these five guards are not guards but they're precious picassos all right so i have placed a picasso here and a picasso there and a picasso there and a picasso here and a picasso there now this picasso is only visible from the red region okay and this picasso is only visible from the blue region this from the cyan uh, i don't know what this color is called whatever okay all right this means just to guard these five picassos i need five guards because their visibility regions do not overlap okay no guard can actually view two, two picassos right the ones that can view this picasso have to be in this red region so this argument shows us that for this particular art gallery five guards are necessary it's not possible to cover the entire art gallery with less than five guards because for these five picassos i need at least five guards so for the entire gallery i need at least five guards and the previous animation showed you that five guards suffice okay so for this art gallery we have actually found out the minimum number of um, guards that i needed so, but that was just one art gallery, right? So, but I could make so many more art galleries, right? And, you know, there are infinitely many of them. So what's the answer for them? Can we say something meaningful about them? Right, so that's the art gallery problem. So here I've, I've draw, drawn some art galleries for you. Now let's, um, I'm going to digress just a little bit. Uh, if you see these art galleries, then there's an inside of these art galleries, right? So, you know, this one has a very bizarre inside. This one has a strange inside also. These are very simple, right? So, if I draw a simple polygon, it's not even obvious that it has an inside and an outside. Okay? I, whenever I tell this thing to... 
my physicist friends, you know, they say you're crazy or something like that. That, you know, if you draw a simple polygon, it will have an inside and it will have an outside. That statement is true, okay? But it's not easy to prove, okay? In fact, it's, it's a very major theorem in topology called the Jordan Curve Theorem, all right? So I just wanted to show people why, um, you know, the inside-outside can be like an issue. So for example, here's a simple polygon, right? Um, and here what I've done is I've placed two points there. Now, just by looking at it, it's not obvious whether these points are inside or outside. Then it becomes obvious these two points are outside. Right? So the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, polygons, you know, although they are very simple things, but proving things about them can be pretty challenging. This, by the way, is called the dragon curve. And, you know, if I just draw the dragon curve without giving you any visual clues, it's not obvious which point is inside and which point is outside. But when I, when I color it, so this happened to be outside, this was inside, right? So, it, I mean, it's, it's not even obvious how to define the inside and outside of a simple polygon. That's a very interesting uh, topological problem, but we're not going to get that much into it. The question that Schwartal asks is how many guards how many guards are needed to guard an art gallery with, okay, and, and you, if you want, you can say walls or you can say corners, okay? Uh, that doesn't really matter, okay? so. If you think about a triangle, um, how many guards are needed? Well, one. You know, and this is a very simple case in which, in this case, you can place the guard anywhere inside the triangle. Okay, triangle is what is called a convex object, which means that you know, if you take any two points inside it, this line segment will remain inside the triangle. All right. Um, if for four. Um, you could have a figure like this, which is convex, which is easy, you know, you can place the guard anywhere, but sometimes, you know, you can have figures like that, right? Okay. In this case, you can't place the guard anywhere, you know, but you could place the guard anywhere in this region. You know, the guard can see everything, right? Here, one of the assumptions that is in the problem is that the guard has a 360 degree vision, okay? And people always say, well, what, you know, that's not very practical or whatever. Well, there are other versions of the art gallery problem. You know, as I told you, there are hundreds of papers on it now. So for four, one is enough. And it turns out that for five also, okay, one, two, three, four, three, four, five, okay? You can always find a place where the guard can view the entire art gallery. So one guard is enough for three, four, and five, but at six, something interesting happens, okay? Which is this art gallery, all right? For this art gallery, you need at least two guards, okay? Can anyone tell me why? Because of the shape? Yeah, but sort of like a mathematician's proof. Well, this is not convex either, okay? Okay, you remember the previous argument that I gave with Picassos, yes. right? So let's place our Picassos one here, and let's place the, the other one over there, right? So now this Picasso can only be seen from the red region, and that Picasso can only be seen from the purple region. Okay, so just covering these two Picassos would require you to um, need, you need at least two guards. So this is an art gallery that does, cannot be guarded with, with one guard. This needs two. All right, two guards. Okay. 
All right, and this example can actually be amplified. Okay, what I can do is I can make this figure which is called the comb for obvious reasons. Um, if some better artists were drawing it, it'll look really like a comb. But let's say it has one, two, three, four, up to k spooks in it, right? Then we could um, repeat the argument, the Picasso argument. We could say that we place Picassos on these spooks, all right? And these spooks, the visibility regions are disjoint, and therefore this requires at least, at least k guards, all right? So k guards are needed, needed for this, this uh, particular art gallery. In this case, if you count the number of vertices, that's one, two, three, one, two, three. So three for every um, spook over there. So here n is equal to three times k. Right? Okay. The number of vertices is actually three times the number of spooks, right? Okay. So we have found an example in which n is three times k, but at least k guards are needed, right? And Schwartal's art gallery theorem says that this is the worst possible example anyone can construct, okay? If you try to come up with a better example, right? So for example, if you take uh, n equals 24, all right? So this particular one would require eight guards, and on 24 vertices, you cannot conceivably make an art gallery which requires nine. Okay, that this is the worst case. Is this the same with this, this second trial, or is there a way to, I mean, how to know that this is the most complicated or difficult configuration? That's the beautiful theorem of Schwartal, and that's what I'm going to prove. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, I, I, well, uh, I don't know how he came up with it, right? But you will see, so what Schwartal's theorem, let me write it down and then we'll, uh, <clears throat> oops, this is such beautiful artwork, I feel so guilty. Uh, if you have placed the guards at the bottom, that would also have been K guards. Um, yeah, so, so this, uh, this art gallery, um, K guards suffice. That's, uh, you can place them over here, right? But what we're trying to prove is that K guards are necessary. And to prove that K guards are necessary, what I do is I place the Picasso here and argue that now this Picasso can be watched by a guard which has to be placed in this red region. And the second Picasso has to be placed uh, has to be watched by a guard, which cannot be the same as this one, all right? And so k are necessary. What about the gap between these cones? Okay, so I'm right now arguing k guards are necessary, right? To see that k guards are sufficient, you just follow Pervez's idea, you know, just place them here. Yeah. Actually, it's easy to prove that k guards are sufficient. Okay, the other side is typically the hard one. That these many, because to show that these many guards are sufficient, I just place them for you, right? And say, look, you know, I've solved the problem. But how do I convince you that, you know, in this complicated art gallery, you need at least 17 guards, okay? I can place 17 guards and say, look, they don't cover the art gallery, but you can tell me that I'm stupid. You know, maybe if I move them around, all right, so that's the tough part, okay? All right, so this example shows, and, uh -huh. yes, yes, please. Uh, why a physicist can see at one glance that, okay, this is like this, and mathematician, it takes like years and years to prove that thing, which is somewhat intuitive. Oh, you mean to say the Jordan curve theorem, right? Well, like Pervis made uh, intuitive thing, and uh, Schwartal has made like spent years. 
Uh, well, uh, we haven't uh, actually written down Schwarzschild's theorem. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, so the difference between mathematicians and uh, and uh, 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 physicists, you know, that I was listening to Feynman once, and he said that he went to a mathematician who was doing something in R D. Okay. And so Feynman sort of told him that look for the universe d is equal to three or something like that. So he said, okay, you know, just substitute d equals three in all my <laughs> theorems. <laughs> okay. Now here's the thing: the Jordan curve theorem is true in two dimensions, but it's not true in three dimensions. There's something called Alexander's horns, which is a counterexample that you know you cannot prove something like. Jordan curve theorem in three dimensions. So perhaps mathematicians tend to generalize too quickly, right? And and um, okay, so so there's a wonderful story here. I'll 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 try to there. So here's the theorem of Schwartz. So I just say that Schwartz's theorem says n over three guards. Whoops, sorry, I've done that wrong. Guard suffice to guard any n wall or corner, whatever you prefer, art gallery. Okay, all right. So he's saying this is the worst example. Uh, we haven't proved that this is the worst example. Maybe. You know, some genius can come up with. But once we prove this, right, then that tells us that is the worst example. Give up. You know, stop trying because Schwartz has uh, finished this problem for you. Okay, all right. So, yes. Um, so the floor function is the best way to define it is suppose you have a non-integer like 3.5 or 1.8. What you do is you forget the decimal part and take the integer part. So 3.5, the floor of that is just 3. 1.8, the floor of that is 1. OK, just take the integer part. Sorry, Round sorry. down. Huh? But negative 1.2? <laughs> well, <laughs> strictly speaking, it's the largest integer that is less than or equal to a quantity. So now you figure out <laughs> from there, <laughs> okay? So, okay, so you round down, you know, for positive integers. For Schwartz's theorem, it's not, negatives are not important, right? Okay, so he says that n over three guards suffice. And Schwartz gave a proof, which is also very beautiful, but another person, Steve Fisk, okay? He gave, um, even more charming proof, you know, it's, it's just, it's a gem. So, you know, I hope you enjoy it as much as I have. So, so our goal is now to try to prove this theorem. Okay, so. And, and, you know, during the course of this talk, you'll see how mathematicians think. And I want to show you how sometimes subtle errors can creep in if you're not as careful as a mathematician. So let's take a polygon, all right? Okay, so I'm just drawing a polygon. Now, what uh, mathematicians do is once you give them a simple polygon, nowadays they compulsively, what they call triangulate it. Essentially means they cut it up into triangles. So for example, these two vertices, if I connect them, if I connect these two and connect these two, 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 these two. So now you see every piece of this has become a triangle. Okay, so this is called a triangulation of a polygon. Okay, all right. So uh, let's uh, let's do a little bit of terminology, and for that, I just need a, a very simple picture. 
So here is our favorite four vertex polygon, right? Now, if you see when I connect these two vertices, this edge stays inside the polygon, all right? And such things are called diagonals, okay? So this is a diagonal, all right? It doesn't really mean the traditional diagonal. This is just a definition. On the other hand, when I try to connect these two vertices, okay, this thing goes out of the polygon. So this is not a diagonal. All right, so here what I've done is I've added only diagonals. So for example, if I try to connect these two, this goes out of the triangle for, out of the polygon for a little while. So this is not even a diagonal. All right, so in a triangulation you add diagonals until every region becomes a triangle. All right. And I can see the look on <laughs> Hassan's face. So is diagonal uh, triangulation unique? Uh, no, no, it's not. Yeah, so for a very, a very beautiful question by Pervez, is it unique? Let's take a square. If I add this diagonal, that's a triangulation. If I add this triangle, that's a triangulation. So the, let's, this is a triangulation, yeah. all right? It's not unique. And, you know, Physicists ask uniqueness, mathematicians ask existence, <laughs> you know. That's the look that Hassan is giving me, that how do, you, how do I know every po polygon can be triangulated? We don't, we don't, okay, it's, it's uh, okay. But uh, what is even harder than that is, okay, so I'm going to write something over here is a lovely statement, okay, that's called Den's Lemma. And, you know, if the name seems suspicious, yes, this is the same Den, Hilbert student who, you know, worked on cuttings and things like that. And Den's Lemma says that every polygon with at least uh, four vertices, so greater than or equal to uh, four vertices, has a diagonal. Okay? All right. Now, if you think about it, triangulation is saying a lot more. It's saying I can find diagonals so that the polygon is cut up into triangles. Den's lemma is saying not a lot. It's just saying that if you take a polygon on more than four vertices, you can find at least one diagonal, a diagonal. All right. And, you know, I, uh, I have renamed this lemma. I call this the Den's uh, red wheel Varro lemma. Okay. And you can ask me why I call that later on. Right. Um, okay, so let me tell you something about Den's Lemma. There are at least two modern uh, books, okay, and one of them is a very, very famous uh, mathematics book called Proofs from the Book, which have a wrong proof of Den's Lemma. Yeah, and I'll tell you where they go wrong. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has a wrong proof. Yeah, so I'll tell you where it goes wrong, so, okay. Okay, so this is, uh, so let's first prove this. And, you know, people who are uh, computer scientists or mathematicians will realize that the hard part is Den's Lemma. Because see, what happens is if Den's Lemma gives you a diagonal, oops, if Den's Lemma gives you a diagonal, then the problem falls apart into two pieces. And you can triangulate this side by induction, you can triangulate this side by induction. So Den's lemma is really, you know, giving us the triangulation, right? But how do we find a diagonal? All right, so the proof is as follows, okay? So uh, let's uh, look at a polygon, okay? And if you see some of these angles, interior angles, they're less than 180 degrees, okay? 
and some of them are more than 180 degrees, right? Okay, the ones that are less than 180 degrees, they are called convex, okay? And the ones that are more than 180 degrees, they are called reflex, okay? So, you know, so for example, this one has, whoops, my, these three are convex angles, but this one is reflex. All right, so a polygon can have uh, convex angles or reflex angles. So the first step in the proof of Den's lemma is find a vertex where the angle is convex. Okay, all right, so for example, in this particular polygon, you can take this vertex, all right? So you will find a vertex where the angle is convex. So there would be this V vertex and this angle would be convex, okay? So it will be connected to a vertex U and then let's say to a vertex W, all right? And this angle is less than 180 degrees. Right. And here's your polygon, and it could be very something extremely bizarre, right? Extremely weird. Okay, now what we're going to do is we will draw this line through UV and we'll march towards this line. Okay, and let's say we reach here without encountering any other vertex of the polygon. All right, so if I start from here and start marching in this direction and reach here, and I don't re encounter any other vertex of the polygon, then I have found my diagonal. Okay, in this case, this would be my diagonal UV. All right, okay. But something strange can happen. This polygon can actually come and, you know, disturb me, right? So in this case, I will do, what I'll do is I'll stop at the first vertex that I encounter. Let's call that X, all right? And in that case, this is my diagonal, all right? So either way, I find the diagonal. So if, if we have just triangle, so in that case, the X would also be diagonal. Uh, so you, need, you need four vertices, right? So this means that we cannot take the triangle case. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is, yeah, this is required in, yeah. So what will happen is, once you take these two vertices, they can't be adjacent because it's not a triangle. That's required there, yeah. So you need that hypothesis, all right? So the proof is very simple. Start from a convex vertex and march towards U and W. If you reach there without encountering any vertex, that's your diagonal. If you encounter a vertex, stop there and this is so very simple, right? So Den's lemma is proved, except one thing is left. How do I find a convex vertex? Does every polygon have a convex vertex? All right. <laughs> so this is something mathematicians will say. You know, you have to prove the existence of a convex vertex, right? One of the books, Rorke's book says, it's obvious every polygon has a convex vertex. All right, um, and I'll tell you the wrong proof in proofs from the book. Okay, um, so I, whenever in mathematics somebody says it's obvious, I'm reminded of one of my teachers, you know, his name was Andrew Granville. And you know, one of the habits we had as sort of pompous young students was we used to say it's trivial, right, instead of it's obvious, and he would, Every time I said it's trivial, Andrew would say that if something is trivial, there's a two-line explanation for it. It's trivial is one line. Now you have one line to explain it to me. In. <laughs> okay, So I stopped saying that. So how do we know that every polygon has a uh, convex vertex? All right. And let me tell you a wrong proof which appears in proofs from the book. Okay, the wrong proof that appears in proofs from the book is 
it says that the sum of the interior angles in the n gone is 180 degrees times n minus 2. Agree? Okay. All right. So, since so they can there must be at least three convex points, right? Because you know if you have more than n minus two reflex points, their sum will be more than n minus two or times one eighty, right? Why is this proof wrong? Example? No, <laughs> this proof is wrong because the only way I know how to prove this is using Den's lemma. The only way I know how to prove this statement is using Den's lemma. How do I prove this? <laughs> then, then the burden of proof is on me for this statement, and I'm using Den's lemma to prove this statement. All right. And so I cannot use this in proving Den's lemma, right? The argument becomes circular, right? Um, so using Den's lemma, I can prove this for you. This is simple induction, okay? You take your polygon, okay? You find a diagonal in it, okay? On this side, you have k points. Right on this side, you have n minus k plus two points because these two points are counted in both of them. So the sum of the angles over here is k minus two times 180 degrees, and the sum of the angles over here is n minus k times 180 degrees, and that's n times n minus two times 180 degrees. That's a correct proof, but it uses Den's lemma. Where did the diagonal come from? From Den's lemma. So I can't use this statement to prove Den's lemma. I'm begging the question. Right? Okay, so that becomes begging the question. Right? So, so what seems obvious, you know, okay, so now the thing is every polygon has a convex vertex. That's not very hard to prove. Okay, without using the dense lemma. And, but you have to give the right argument. What's the correct argument? And the correct argument is just right under our nose. Take the lowest point. That has to be convex. Okay. Okay, so let me write that down. Uh, the lowest point is always convex in any polygon, okay? Because here's your lowest point, right? Nothing can be below it. So, you know, this angle has to be, okay? <laughs> but, you know, but the, proof of this, huh? the lowest point is always convex. Uh, right in front of you, okay? Take the lowest point, right? Let's call this P. Right? In your polygon, you have a point before that. That must be above this line. And a point after that, that can't be below this point either. So, so how do you define lowest point? Uh, the lowest y coordinate. That's easy. Yeah. You mean extreme in some kind Actually, you could take the rightmost yeah. point, leftmost yeah. point, uh, <laughs> topmost point. Okay, you won't get uh, four different ones, you might get just three. So it's, I mean, this is interesting, right? That the proof is easy, but yeah, there are several books which have a, a wrong proof. And it's very subtle because this theorem requires Den's lemma and induction. And so in Den's lemma, I'm not allowed to use it, okay? Otherwise, I'm begging the question. You know, otherwise, I'm just proving things that I'm already assuming, okay? All right, okay, so now we are almost at the end. Okay, so now let's take a polygon and I've sort of made a small figure so I don't 
mess it up and don't make it look. No, 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 no. You can, okay, so you can have multiple lowest points, right? But the point before and after, okay, this angle would be. So, so polygon can have multiple lowest points like this, right? But each lowest point would be convex. Similarly, it can have multiple rightmost points. You can repeat the argument in any direction, right? Okay, so if this is the lowest point, think about the on the polygon, the point before and after. The only way to get it reflex is to put one of them down. But that you're not allowed to do because you've already picked the lowest point, okay? Yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> you have to assume ordering is possible. Huh? You have to assume ordering is possible. Oh, so a, a polygon by definition has been ordered, yeah. right? Yeah, so, uh, oh, uh, so there are two. Uh, so when you give me a polygon, you actually give me P1, P2, P3, and P4, right? You give me ordering. So for example, if you were to give me Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, that's not a simple polygon because you're in some sense telling me to do this. So an ordering on the vertices is a part of the polygon. This is my first vertex, a circular order. Okay, so yeah. Okay, so now, now we're going to... In case of circle, we can take any point, point as a least point. In uh, case... In, in limiting case, if we take the circle. If you take the... Uh, the infinite case, infinite uh, uh, a polygon with infinite vertices, the circle. Yeah, you're that big. Then you have to actually do some topology. But mm -hmm. yeah, you could take the... So any point uh, can but, be... You will have to re define the angles, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the limiting case. Okay. Okay, so, so the thing will have to be differentiable or things like that. Okay. So I think it will get technical. Okay. Yeah, I, I, let me not uh, get into that, okay? okay? All right, so let's, um, let me draw this polygon that I had thought of, triangulate this, think like that, and like this, like this, like this, like this, like this, like this. All right, so this is triangulated right now, all right. So every polygon can be triangulated, and the proof is just Den's lemma. You find a diagonal that breaks the problem into two smaller problems, and you solve them separately and, and put the solution together. Now what we do is we start viewing this triangulation. We view this triangulation, 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 as a graph, okay? And not as a graph in terms of y equals x squared, but graph in terms of graph theory, where we have vertices and we have edges, okay? So all the vertices of the polygon are vertices, and all the edges of the polygon plus the added diagonals are edges. So whenever you give a graph to a graph theorist, what they do is they start compulsively coloring the vertices. All right? So they start coloring the vertices of these, uh, this graph. And one of the rules that they love is when two things are connected, their colors cannot be the same. Okay? So what we want to do is we want to color this graph with colors such that if two things are connected, they get different colors. All right? And the lovely theorem is that every triangulation is three colorable, okay? That I can just pick three colors and color the vertices here in such a way that if two things are connected, they will get a different colors, all right? Okay, so this is 
So this is actually a theorem from graph theory, right? Actually, it's a mixture of graph theory and geometry, but very, very simple, that every triangulation is three colorable. And the way we do this is once again, and that's why I call, that's why this Den's lemma is very important, and we'll use Den's lemma to do this. Okay, so among mathematicians, the, um, you know, they say that every mathematician has more or less a theorem to their name. And it's a real distinction to have a lemma to your name. Okay, that's used over and over again. And, you know, so you see this being used again. Uh, all right, so what we do is, let me see if I can get this right. We say that this is a diagonal, all right? So this problem falls apart into two pieces, right? One is this and the other is this, okay? So let's start coloring this part of the graph. So let me put, a, how have I done? Red here, color, okay? So red and I guess I can, red there and let's say let me put a green here okay and so this would mean that I can't I can neither color this red nor I can color this green so let me color this purple all right and uh, uh, let's see this is red and green that means I cannot color this red or green so this one is forced to get purple this is red and purple, so this one is forced to get green, okay? And this one is forced to get red, right? So I have managed to color this part of the graph. Now I have to do the other one. So what we can do is we can redraw that graph, and I'm going to try to copy it uh, as accurately as I can. Hmm. That seems like that graph, right? Uh, sorry, the leftover part of it. I mean, this part, have I copied that fairly accurately? Yep, it seems so. All right. And let's color this say red and what we can do is um, let's color this green so that means that gets purple and this means this gets green okay uh, Red, uh, oh, wait, 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 sorry, I just uh, made a mess out of this. I wanted this, this purple, okay. That means this would get green, all right. And this would get, whoops, purple. This would get green and this would get red okay so I can do this part also now I have to put these two colorings together all right and let's call this vertex a and this vertex B so here we have a and here we have B so what happens if I just take these colors and put them over there okay something goes wrong here a is colored green all right, and over there A is colored purple, all right. Here um, B is colored purple and over there it's colored green. So if I were to just take this, this solution of this sub problem and put it here, try to cut and paste it here, it's not going to work, all right. So any ideas how we can make this work? Okay, yeah, so you've got that. So what you've got is that these colors you can permute, right? 
So what I want to do is I want to change this green color into, I want green to go to purple, right? And I want this purple to go to green. Oops. Okay. And then red will stay red. Okay. So if I use that scheme and recolor this, then I'll be able to cut and paste this together. Was that a little? Uh, it's fine. It's, it's just that you chose the wrong color on that side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the whole point. So what you do is you you uh, do the coloring here, and then you use these two colors to do the coloring on that side. So you color it with three colors, right? Okay. So let's put all the facts that we have <coughs> on, uh, on the board. Number one is that every polygon can be triangulated. Okay. Number two is that um, a triangulation is always three color okay all right so you take your graph and you triangulate it and then you three color it right now the observation is that at least at least one color must be used at most n over 3 times, right? It's not possible that all three colors are used more than n over 3 times, right? This is just the pigeonhole principle. I have n vertices, I'm coloring them with three colors. So there must be one color that is used at most n over 3 times, all right? So what you can think of is the colors as being bins, right, okay, colors as being bins, and you're putting the vertices into these three bins, right? So if I take n vertices and I throw them in three bins, well, one of the bins will have at most n over three vertices. It's not possible for me to put more than n over three vertices in all three bins, right, okay? Is that, okay, so I'm taking n vertices and I'm throwing them in three bins, right? So I'm saying that one bin must have at most n over three vertices. Not making sense because I take 12 vertices, hmm. we are throwing it in the three bins. Holes. Yeah. And uh, then your argument is uh, how you put this at most n by 3, which is 4. Hmm. I mean, how you put, say, your argument is right. I, so you, dis I didn't understand your comment at all. Okay, I'm taking n is equal to 12. Right. And there are three so, holes. So, so what I'm saying is, if you take 12 vertices, yes. you place them in these three holes the way you want. Okay, I'll always find one of the bins in which you put more, less than or equal to four vertices. It's not possible for you to put more than five vertices in all of them because there aren't that yeah. many vertices to begin with. That's the argument. Right. It's, it's a triviality, right? I got the point, thank you. Okay, I agree. You know, if I have 27 uh, vertices and I put them in three bins, it's not possible for me to put, then, put more than 10 in all of them. Okay, I can't put 10, nine, more than nine in all of them because I don't have that many vertices. So once you've placed them, I'll find one hole in which there are at most n over three vertices, right? Okay, so here I have a graph on n vertices and I have colored it with three colors. So one of the colors must be used less than or equal to n over three times, okay? 
All right. So let's say the color green was used less than or, and over three times. This is where I'm going to place my guards. Okay. So I've placed at most n over 3 guards. All right. Now each triangle has a green vertex. So every triangle is being watched by a guard. But this polygon is union of those triangles. So I've covered all the triangles. Therefore, I've covered all the guards. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, OK, maybe, maybe we can fight over this a little bit. <laughs> OK, so, so the proof of Schwartz's theorem is following. Take your polygon, triangulate it. OK, triangulate the polygon, now color it with three colors. Why can you triangulate the polygon? Dense lemma. Why can you color it with three colors? Dense lemma. OK, now you've colored it with three colors. Look at the least frequently used color. The least frequently used color must be used at most n over three times. Okay, place your guards on those vertices. All right, now go and look at your polygon. If you look at your polygon, if you look at any triangle, there's a green vertex somewhere. There's a guard sitting there watching. So you've covered all the triangles and therefore you have covered all the polygon. So for example, in this, uh, well, we'll have to color the whole thing. Let's do that. So here's red and here's purple. And I guess this would be red, okay? And this would be green, green, okay, green. So let's see how many times green is used. One, two, three. So green is used three times. Red is used one, two, three times. Okay, and purple is used twice, okay, three times. Oh, this is a pathetic case, okay. Huh? Red is four times? Okay, yeah, red is four times. So either what you can do is place your guards at the green places, three of them, okay, and if you place it there, you see this is all covered, okay, this is all covered, this, everything is covered. Or if you prefer, you can put them at purple places. These three guards would do also. In this case, you have, you know, uh, two solutions, right? Okay, so, yeah, yes. <laughs> so, 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 here, so that's the proof, you know, take uh, your polygon, triangulate it. Three color the triangulation, one of the colors is used Least frequently, use that color, place the guards there. You're done. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, once you get used to of these things, you can, you know, do this while you're walking in a park. Right, but it, took, it takes me a long time to understand this. Right, just spectacular. And, and see, there are three beautiful subjects. There's basic geometry, nothing complicated. Uh, then there's basic graph theory, the tr three coloring. Okay, and there's basic combinatorics, that's the pigeonhole principle. Now, typically the pigeonhole principle is used backwards. Okay, people say if there are n bins, one of the bins must have at least n over three vertices. All right, here we're using it the other way around. Okay, and the pigeonhole principle just says that the maximum is greater than or equal to the average, right? And the minimum is less than or equal to the average, right? Okay, all right, so now I get to ask one question. Where does the floor come from? So remember I said that in Schwartz's theorem, we would do this, round it down. Yeah, the minimum is always an integer. So what I have proof for you is that the least frequently used color is used at most n over three times, but since it's an integer, you know, it doesn't have a choice. It has to go below the, uh, below the floor or less than or equal to the floor. So, 
<laughs> okay. So, yeah, so there are lots, I mean, in this little theorem, there is a lot to learn, I feel, that uh, the subtlety of mathematics, the, the fact that obvious things are obvious, but we are sometimes misled and, you know, we get wrong proofs of them. And, uh, and, and you know, the, the fact that, uh, oh, by the way, there's two things that I wanted to tell you. There's another beautiful theorem, I forgot the name of the person who proved it. He has shown that n over 3 half guards suffice. Okay, half guards. A half guard is, is uh, when you place a guard, it has a 360 degree vision. A half guard is, you know, it has a, only a nine, uh, 180 degree vision. And the beauty of that theorem is n over 3 doesn't change. You know, so he restricts the guards without uh, redu increasing the number of guards. Okay. And one last thing, and this is something you guys can work on, is let me tell you what a wall guard is. Uh -huh. okay. So typically we put a, uh, think of a guard as a vertex, right, as a point. Now, what a wall guard is, it is assigned a edge in the polygon. It's assigned a wall. And the wall guard keeps moving back and forth. All right, so a wall guard is far more powerful than an ordinary guard. Now, there is a conjecture which says that n over 4 wall guards suffice. Okay, and this is as old as Schwartal's theorem, which is about 50 years old. No proof. Okay, so that's something to think about. Very simple to state. We don't know. If you take examples, is that what it works out? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lots and lots of examples. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, also I wanted to tell you that this, uh, you saw I, in my program I was computing visibility regions, right? Uh, okay. The algorithm for computing visibility region is, was so subtle that we had a wrong algorithm for five years before somebody figured out that it was incorrect. Okay, so these computational geometry uh, code can also be very subtle. You know, so, but you know, this is other people's work. Okay, so let's, shall we stop here? Okay. Questions? I'm just thinking that this whole theorem is on, on Euclidean geometry, Euclidean flat surface. Is there any other version on, on spherical surface or maybe hyperbolic? People, I think, have looked at, uh, at this problem, but that's a bit out of my league. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, what is interesting is, for example, if you have an N vertex, and you have to define the proper object, but a polyhedron kind of a three-dimensional thing. Um, it turns out that you need up to some constant times n squared guards. Okay. So in three dimensions, things become totally uh, different. But even on, on, on the surface of the sphere, we can have the triangulation. You know? Yeah. So, that same is, is not true. It is the same theorem if we take the triangulation on the surface of the sphere. Okay, uh, it seems like the, uh, the theorem may actually go through, but you know, mathematics is subtle. Unless I've checked out all the details, I won't bet on it, right? You wouldn't have three, uh, uh, one eight is the sum of the... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Then everything will change. Maybe some people try it. Yeah, so you, you will have to define what a convex vertex is. Please throw some light on n over 3 and n over 4. I have some confusion understanding. Okay, so look, when we take a guard, right, we say the guard can see like in all directions. Right? That's what Schwartal calls a guard, right? So we, here we define a new kind of a guard which is more powerful in the sense that this guard is assigned a wall of the art gallery and she moves back and forth. And she's responsible for all the region that it can be seen from any of these points. Okay? So the visibility region of that guard is the union of the visibility region of all the guards. 
right? So it'll have a bigger, all right? So for example, so let me give you an example that if you have a wall like this, all right, okay? And let's say this is the art gallery like that. Now, uh, you can place a guard here and she can see this thing, right? But she can't see that part. Now, if you place, if you assign a wall guard here, right? Then she'll come here, watch this region, and she'll come there and watch that region, right? So it's a slightly more powerful guard. Four indicates that mobility. No, four. It's the conjecture. It's uh, there are examples in which people can argue that n over four guards are necessary. And they cannot construct examples in which more are needed. So this is a conjecture. Yeah. yeah. So conjecture is some open problem. Yeah. Yes, computer guard could have a 360 degree angle, but not a human. Yeah. So so the, in mathematics, the guard is the terminology, and then they put restrictions on it. So there are theorems which say that what if I have guards with 60 degree vision? You know, I don't want my guard going, you know, like that. So what happens then and, you know, there are all sorts of. So in mathematics, what you do is you solve one abstract problem first to understand it. And then you start introducing variables which take you closer to real life. So in, in science, that's what we do. We take a simple model. Once we understand that, then we start adding more details to it so that it becomes close to real life. Thank you.